Sorry. Cool. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, turn on your cameras if you can. Sean Sturrock, good morning. Brandy, brand new with us. Sterling, yeah, I feel like time. you got to always use your line that you use about the cameras now. Like, you know, you've started it, you just got to go with it. Well, it's true. If, yeah, <laughs> I always say if you're in the shower, don't turn on your camera. If you're not in the shower, turn on your camera. Other than that, turn them on. <laughs> yeah. I've got my hat on. I, you know, you don't want to see under here. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Look at that. <laughs> so anyway, guys, it's great to see you. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. If you're a, a guest with us, um, welcome. You're always welcome. We do this every Tuesday morning. Um, part of Freedom Team with EXP. Freedom Team is about 2,500 agents all across the country. Uh, what, 47 states now? I think, is that right, Sean? 47 states? Last seven yes, seven countries so um anyway we do this every tuesday just uh you know one of 18 different masterminds we do on a monthly basis in addition to all the stuff that exp offers so doing some uh doing some big things whatever we can do to help you guys with your business and and growing things growing a team if you want to build a team traditional team modern team whatever you want to do all kinds of things we're doing here to help with that so um we kind of host this kathy and i co-host it every uh every Tuesday. So anyway, today, uh, Kelly Fasterling, she was on here, what, three or four weeks ago, month ago, maybe we did a, uh, a training. She's a financial, uh, a certified financial planner, financial advisor, uh, by trade, you know, whatever, been doing that for a long time, but also been a realtor for seven, eight years now. And, uh, here with EXP for the last, what, four years now, Kathy, Kelly, uh, about three and a half, three and a half years. Yeah. So anyway, um, she did a great training. You know, the first one she did, we were like, wow, I know there's more you could do that would just help all of us in terms of, you know, just our own financial situations and how we handle money as realtors, different things. And so we wanted to talk to her about doing another one and she's going to take it today. So why don't you go ahead, Kelly, you can introduce yourself and then introduce Steve um, and get us going. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Cool. So today, Thank you. our focus is going to be on wealth momentum through real estate. So let's talk first about what momentum even is. You know, if you look at the definition, it's the strength or force gained by motion or a series of events, or the increase in the rate of development of a process. And really that's where I feel I've come through in, in my history. Now, my history wasn't as positive years ago, but about 10 years ago, I really started to turn it around. So if you go back, to my 25 years in corporate, all I knew about was my 401k. I invested away. In 2001, I lost half of it. In 2008, I lost half of it. In 2006, I got divorced and got to share it. Um, had three teenage kids that I was financially 100% responsible for, and I needed to change. It, it, it had to shift. So about 10 years ago, I really set an intention, set a focus to learn about real estate investing and to move into that world. And I did so through, how many of you have read Rich Dad, Poor Dad? And, and seen that book, yeah, exactly. That's where I started. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, not only started with the book, went to the seminar, did the full series, did the mentoring, got my first house. So I was kind of on the path to do it. And then I got stuck because I was doing it here in Colorado Springs and I couldn't find that next home. It was kind of like the market has been for the last year where you'd put an offer in, you'd have 20 offers right behind you and you, you, you couldn't get anything that made sense as an investor. That's when I was introduced to Steve's team. Steve Earl here is with us. Um, Steve's group is called Done For You Real Estate. They're out of Utah. I was introduced to Steve's team by a guy in Colorado Springs here that wanted to be a, me to be a credit partner. Uh, what do you mean? I don't know what that means. And I went to kind of his lunch and I learned about what he was doing. And then I actually drove up there to Utah and met Steve, looked at what he did, how he did it. I have since in 10 years with his group done 19 homes of which this is where the momentum comes in. You start with one. I started with one in 2012. And one grows a little bit, and then pretty soon you can get two, and then two grow, and you can get four, and four grow, and you can get eight. So now I'm sitting with, with homes that I've purchased, and I sold some, and I did a 1031 exchange to not pay capital gains, and 
bought more. So I'm sitting now on 14 homes 10 years later that basically Steve's team has really been the, the powerhouse, the momentum builder behind what I've been able to do. And so not only did he help with that, but then I learned about other techniques where as I'm trying to save my money, how to make my money work for me while I'm saving it, getting ready to buy the next house. So I did both, but let me introduce um, Steve to you. Steve, why don't you just share a little bit about your history and, and yourself and what your group does? Sure, I, I appreciate that, Kelly. And uh, it, it's a real it's a real privilege for me to uh, be able to be a part of uh, Jeff and Sean's group here and to be able to you know be with you guys here this morning. So I actually, I grew up in Canada um, and uh, left home. Uh, when I was about, well, I got married up there, and 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 my wife and I decided to move down to the U.S. down to Utah um, to finish up some schooling. I was actually planning to be a dentist of all things. I thought that to be successful in life, you had to be a dentist or a doctor or an attorney. I thought you had like three choices in life, <laughs> and uh, I learned fairly quickly after you know going through school. I did all the the you know the you know, all the pre-dent stuff. I got a degree in business management along the way because I was re really interested in business. I'd always been an entrepreneur as, as, a, as a kid and I uh, had never really had like a real job. I always did like entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial type things. And while I was in college down here, I started up a little painting company. And uh, after I graduated and had decided after, you know, that I wasn't going to be a dentist, I was going to, you know, do something else. Um, I learned real quickly as I started interviewing for different jobs that I could make more money um, in one summer as a painting contractor than I could in an entire year working for somebody else. And so uh, I decided that instead of getting a job that I would just continue on with my, my little company and uh, started growing that. And along the way, um, I had I. I, uh, one of the, one of the individuals who I did a lot of work for, uh, was in real estate. He became a mentor for me and, uh, I saw what he was doing and, and, uh, and so while I near the end of owning this company, I sold my company in 2004, I'd started buying homes and flipping them and, and just really was passionate about real estate, uh, in, in, in the work world, I'm, I'm passionate about two things. I'm, I'm passionate about, uh, business and real estate. And so at that point, I decided that I was going to sell my company and, and become a full-time real estate investor. And so that's what I did uh, the day that I, uh, from the day that I decided to sell the, uh, my company, it took me about a year, sold it and started just flipping homes. And uh, that's kind of how I cut my teeth in real estate. And uh, fairly quickly, I realized that I didn't have enough money to do all the great deals that I was finding. That's one thing that I uh, learned that I was good at was, was finding and sourcing uh, properties that made sense uh, to buy. And, and so I decided to get my real estate license and uh, started helping my friends and family kind of do what I was doing. And I soon, soon learned that like it didn't work very well for, you know, my friends and family to flip homes. Um, that's more of a job. It's kind of a full-time thing. It's not really investing. It's, it's you know, it's, it's a cool thing. It's awesome. Uh, and it was really a job. And so I kind of changed up my model and, uh, and started uh, hanging on to properties and buying them, fixing them up and renting them out. And that was a more duplicatable model that I could help my friends and family do. And so that's what I started doing. And um, within three years, uh, I became the top broker or, or the top agent in, in the brokerage that I was with. And it's it was a pretty fairly good sized uh, um, office that I was in. And I didn't list homes. Um, I, I maybe had two or three listings during those three years. I, I just helped people buy homes. And so I was just helping them kind of do this model. And so after three years, I... Um, I stopped and uh, being just an agent, I opened up my own brokerage and and then I I bought um, a mortgage company because there's an opportunity there. And then I started an insurance company and uh, partnered up with a few people and and kind of created this organization that helped regular individual people um, invest in single family homes. And over the years, that's what has become known as today is done for you real estate USA. We we now have clients in every state in the nation. And um, we buy, we don't buy anything in Utah. It's out, all outside of Utah because of the model that we have. We keep, we look for, I won't get, I won't take too much time to, to, to describe those details, but, but in a nutshell, that's what we do. And that's how I, I got into real estate. And so what's interesting is I'm an, I'm an organization of, I have 24 full-time people 
and uh, last uh, this year we'll you know we'll do uh, just over 400 uh, real estate transactions and just over 400 mortgage uh, uh, transactions as well as policies and so on and I'm the only like there's, there's two licensed agents and everything that we do in Dunphy real estate is uh, it just runs, runs through uh, my license. And so we're, we're a niche, you know, we're not some crazy big organization, um, but we just kind of figured out our little thing. And, and what's really cool is that it just works. And I had the fantastic opportunity of meeting um, Kelly about 10 years ago. And it's been my opportunity to work with her for, for several years. And it's been really fun to see and watch her grow her portfolio and see her succeed in such a big way um, on the investing side of real estate. And so she's just become such a great friend. Um, and I would even say a mentor to me. She's uh, one of the smartest people that I know. And she is so thoughtful in terms of, of understanding uh, so many different aspects of the financial world, both real estate and uh, the financial markets and so on. So that's that's a little bit about uh, about me. Hopefully that wasn't too long, Kelly. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and tell me um, a couple of stories about how real estate that you guys have done has truly changed the lives of a couple of the people that you've worked with. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, at, at every day this morning, uh, as I was working out, I listened to a podcast by Ed Milet. I don't know if anybody knows Ed. Uh, or follows him. Uh, it was just an awesome podcast. And, and one of the, th the things that he talked about is the concept of like, what is your why? Like when you've got like goals is having goals, isn't why you get up in the morning. It's, it's like, the, the, it's really like, um, wh what are the emotional connections to those goals? Like, what are the things behind those goals that get you up in the morning, that get you motivated, that get you excited about the day? And I tell you what, in our company, the culture that we've created is one of, of one of the most fulfilling and satisfying things is seeing regular, ordinary people who are good at what they do. They're busy being school teachers and firefighters and doctors and uh, just members of their community doing what they do. They just know that they need to have real estate in their portfolio. And so what we do is we facilitate that process. And so it's been really fun over the years. Uh, we've we've helped literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people now achieve what is kind of the epitome of success for one of our clients. Because I'll, I'll tell you right now, our clients are not like multi gazillionaires. They're not invest real estate investors per se. They're just like I mentioned, these regular people. And so our goal for our clients is to help them build a small portfolio of real estate. And and real estate and success defined in our company is owning ten properties. And so whether that takes you, you know, whether you do that in your first year or whether it takes you 20 years, that's kind of the definition of success because when you have 10 properties and ultimately you have them paid off, like that's a six-figure income. That's passive income. And, and it's, and it's life-changing. And so um, I'll, I'll share the story of one individual. His name is Ron Diviak. He, he grew up in Illinois. He is in the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame. If you ever watched the show Hoosiers, uh, he was part of that group of individuals. Um, and Ed didn't discover us until he was in his uh, mid seventies. And uh, they, they actually, him and his, his, he has a handicapped son who's down, down syndrome. They heard a radio spot and his son of all people was like, dad, you need to do this. And his, his dad was like, what? And so he decided to look into it and he's really, he's really skeptical at first. He's, he's, he's very, uh, very conservative but he's like, I'm, I'm going to follow the intuition of my son. I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to buy one property. He bought one property. Uh, long story short, uh, about 10 years later, he had 10 properties. And one of his statements to us has been, I used to have nightmares about my retirement, and now I don't. And it was life-changing. He got his family into, into position through real estate because he was a school teacher. Um, he was a man of faith. He coached basketball. And just a, just a regular, normal, good person, but he had no path to financial uh, uh, or economic, you know, independence at age, like I say, is like 73, 75, right around there. And um, so Ron passed away last week um, at the age of 85. Um, he had leukemia. And it was, it, it was really interesting to read his uh, obituary. Uh, it, it you know it shared about his life, his faith, his bath you know basketball, his church service, 
And at the very end, it said a one-liner. And in his later years, he really enjoyed real estate investing. And it is what changed his life. It's what gave him peace, his family peace. His, his fam one of his family's first calls was to done for you real estate. Like we know our clients. We love our clients. There is a story behind every single property that our clients buy. It's meaningful. It's purposeful. One individual home may be what's paying for, you know, a, a couple's ability to take care of, you know, their parents in their old age, maybe to, to pay for, you know, to help pay for, you know, a retirement community, or it may be helping to pay for, a room and board for their child is going to college or what, whatever it is, there is a significant story behind every single one of these homes. So that's kind of our why. And that story, Ron's story is actually, you, you know how, like, whenever, you know, you, you, you're watching somebody talk about real estate, talk about what it is that they do, and they got to put these disclaimers, right? They're telling the story of like what I just did with Ron. And they have to put a little disclaimer that says results not typical. Well, I'm telling you today that those results are typical. Like our real estate, it's not creative. Um, it's it's 25, it's 20 to 25 percent down. It's a 30 year fixed mortgage. You're buying a three bed, two bath, two car garage home in a middle income neighborhood. Um, you're getting good tenants, and it's being managed by by an awesome property management company. And after, so we've we over the the last fifteen years that we've been doing this, we we've helped our clients buy around forty five hundred homes, forty five hundred ish. We have about thirty five hundred homes still under management. And I'm telling you, like the model is when you buy a property, like our we we help our clients understand you need to have you need to be planning to hold on to it five to ten years. And when you do that, it doesn't matter. Like all of a sudden, the market cycle becomes less meaningful, almost meaningless, because this model works at every stage of the real estate um, market. I bought multiple properties in 2007, 2008, right at the peak, right before everything crashed, along with hundreds of my clients. And guess what we did? We just hung on those properties, collected our cash flow, and a few years later, we all crushed it. And so literally, if you hold on to your properties five to 10 years, um, regardless of whether you think you bought a lemon and you've had expenses along the way, um, cause you will have expenses and you will have pain along the way, but it works like literally every time when you, when you, when you buy the properties following you kind of the, the, the methodology, the methodology that, that, that we follow. So anyways, that was one story, uh, um, Ron and, 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 and there are multiple others I, I could tell more, but, um, I, I'm not sure time frame. Well, Steve, uh, let me ask, um, there are many options in, in the investment world of where people can place money and things that can do well for them. Why real estate? So real estate is one of those investments that um, it's conservative. It's a little more predictable. It's a little slower moving. So if you're in the, in the stock market, you know, you can have some, some wild swings and you have, you know, um, you know, it, De depending on your strategy, um, it, it can be, you know, more risky th than not. But more than anything, real estate has some benefits that you cannot get anywhere else. And I might be preaching to the choir here. But when you talk about real estate, and in particular, single family homes, there's multiple streams of income. Um, least of all is cash flow. Now, cash flow is important. Um, but at the end of the day, cash flow is not what uh, creates wealth. It's something that helps you along the way uh, to get there, and it eases the pain, and and uh, and and it's great having cash flow. Um, it, it's a good good thing. So number one, you get some cash flow, and that's one of the the things that we measure when we're determining whether a property is call it purchase worthy is what we call. We don't look for good deals. We just look for purchase worthy properties, and and so the first thing is is cash flow. The second thing that we look at is what we call combined cash on cash, because that takes into account a couple other things. Sometimes you don't you don't think about the fact that you have a tenant who's paying your mortgage every single month and there's principal pay down of several hundred dollars every single month. So there's somebody who's literally contributing to your your income uh, every single month to the tune of several hundred dollars. On top of that, you have depreciation. That's another benefit that you get to capitalize on on an annual basis, uh, which 
equates to several hundred dollars a month. So you take cash flow, uh, principal pay down, and depreciation. Let's say that your cash flow is $250 a month. Your pay, principal pay down is going to be probably close to $250 a month based on the, the typical homes that we buy average purchase price right now is about $275,000. So your principal pay down on a 30-year amortized loan, you're going to be, you know, $250 to $350 a month. And then your depreciation on that um, is going to be another three to four hundred dollars. So um, and so you got those benefits, and then you've got the benefit of appreciation. So over, over the course of time, you have appreciation, whether it's been crazy like it was over the last couple of years, which you know you can't bank on. Um, we we take a very conservative approach. Um, and and you know, even if, if you if you do if you count on the 100 year average of about 3% appreciation um, annually, um, typically when you combine all of those factors together, you know, you're, you're 18 to 22%, um, uh, you know, uh, overall, we, we call it um, average annual uh, return on investment. Now, there's another number that we, that we look at, uh, Kelly, and that is, we, we call it your average monthly increase. When you take all of those different revenue streams and you break it into a dollar figure, you break it into a dollar figure on a simple home, a $275,000 purchase over the course of, and we always, right now we extrapolate out uh, between five and 10 years. You'll see that your average monthly increase is typically between $750 and $1,300 per month. When you take those things, so when when you when you consider you know your down payment and the cost to get into a property, let's say that it's you know eighty thousand dollars to get into a home, twenty five percent down, closing costs, everything, rehab on the property, and your average monthly increase in dollars is is a thousand dollars a month on average. Who's not gonna do that? Like. It is so powerful when you look at it from that standpoint. Now, here's the real kicker, why real estate trumps every other investment out there. And it's called leverage. You get to leverage real estate. So you can buy a property at 200. If you're going to buy stock, $275,000 of stock, how much do you have to uh, invest, Kelly? All of it. All of it, $275,000. If you're going to buy a home, um, let's, make, let's make the numbers easy, 20% of a $300,000 home is $60,000 plus closing costs. So let's just call it $80,000. All of a sudden you get the benefit of a $275,000 or a $300,000 investment working for you. And if, if you're earning 3% just on appreciation, that's $9,000 a year. Like if, if you had to invest the full $300,000, your, your return on investment goes way down because there was no leverage involved. With the leverage, and you let's say you put $85,000 into it, your return on investment is significantly higher. So all of those benefits, all of those revenue streams are, are, are of what def, differentiate real estate. But the kicker is the ability to leverage. It is, it is so powerful. Um, we, have, uh, we have financial planners. Well, um, we have recovering financial planners who work for us. They've transitioned over to real estate uh, 100%. And I shouldn't put it in those terms. Financial planners are awesome. <laughs> uh, our, one of the guys that works in our, in our office, the most probably the most knowledgeable guy as far as that world goes, like ever. Um, and um, when he does his numbers, it's really, it's really fun to see because real estate, when you take all this, these things into account, uh, uh, beats the stock market um, 100% of the time. Now, I'm going to add one more benefit, okay, for this group of people. I normally don't talk about this, but you guys are all real estate professionals. So there's another benefit that we as real estate professionals get to take advantage of that nobody else gets to take advantage of unless you have a lot of passive income. Um, and it's called cost segregation. It's accelerating the benefit of depreciation. In your first year of ownership of a property, you're able to accelerate depreciation. And you literally, if you're an individual who makes six figures a year and you're paying you know, tens of thousands of dollars in taxes, if you as a real estate professional will buy one property per year, like we can show you how you can wipe out that entire tax bill. 
through cost segregation. And it only works because you are a real estate professional. Nobody else gets to participate in that. Um, except the, the only other exception is that if you have a ton of passive uh, income, then um, then you can all then you can take advantage of, of it to a degree. But as real estate professionals, we have that one additional benefit, and it is so so powerful. Um, and but I won't I won't dive too far into that. So that that's the benefit, the blessings of of real estate as opposed to like regular other investments. Well, I'll give you a story, Steve, of, of one of my houses that I bought through you. And it was, I bought it in Tennessee. I paid 170000 for it. And um, after a few years, last year when rates were so low, I refinanced it. So a refinance, it was worth about two twenty five dollars at the time. Got it appraised, got it refinanced. And then I had a REIT come and look me up and find me and offer me uh, two seventy five dollars for it. So I paid one seventy. dollars It was worth two twenty five. They offered me two seventy five. dollars and then by the time I could get the tenant out, they were dropped, they dropped it to 270. And I said, well, I'd still like that 275. Well, they bumped it to 325. <laughs> so I sold that house, paid 170, sold the house for 325 within a four-year period. It cash flowed the entire time. I did a 1031 exchange, so I did not have to pay any capital gains taxes. It was amazing. Amazing. So what are some of the things, Steve, that if somebody was doing it on their own, they're not using you, they're doing it on their own because you've, you've hit all the pitfalls. What should they be watching out for? What do they have to consider? Well, so um, as real estate professionals, you, you know, again, I think I'm not telling you anything that you don't uh, probably already know. Although um, what I have found is in the real estate industry, um, as is true in life in general, um, 20 percent of the people do 80 percent of the work or 20 percent of the people uh, do 80 percent of the deals and um, on the investing side of things um, I would guess that less than 20 percent of real estate agents actually consume their own product actually invest in real estate um, and part of the reason for that is it can be difficult like we all have our niches right when I first got into uh, real estate I felt like a kid in a candy store um, I knew that I wanted to be investing on my own, but I also wanted to kind of act like a real estate agent. I was like, okay, I speak Spanish. So I was like, for a minute, I was like, I'm going to go, I'm going to target the Hispanic community and I'm going to help. And then I was like first time home buyers. And then I was, then I got into a little bit of commercial. And then I, like, I was just kind of all over the place as I was doing my investing. I, I finally figured out, well, wait a minute, I can just help people do what I'm doing. And my point is, is that even though we're all real estate professionals, like I would never, any, if anybody comes to me and, and and I get people all the time saying, hey, can you help me with this commercial deal? Or can you help me sell this commercial building? Because I know a lot of people uh, in the business community. And I'm like, hey, you know what? I would love to help you, but I know a guy who will do a way better job than me because that's just not the world I live in. And so I'll refer them to this buddy of mine who just kills it in commercial real estate. He'll take good care of them. And it's the same thing. Somebody comes to me and says, Hey, can you help me with uh, like buying a primary residence? Like if I have a friend and they're like, hey, my, my kids, you know, they just got married. They're going to buy a house. Can you help them? I'll be like, I would love to. But that's like, that's not my specialty. I know somebody who can help them who that's their world. That's where they live. And so um, the real estate investing world is one of those kind of niche things that um, there's a lot, you know, obviously there's a lot of nuance. They're sourcing the properties. There's the re, the rehab piece that that needs to be completed. Um, there's the 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 renting and the tenant placing placement and the the property management. And that was quite frankly when I first got into this business, I started helping people do what I was doing. Is it kind of started to bog me down because I was helping these people buy these homes, and all of a sudden I was like, I started feeling responsible for their success. And if they would call me up, they're like, oh man, my tenant just like did this. And I'm like, ah, oh, like I feel so bad. Like, how am I going to help them? And, and it can become overwhelming if that's not the world that, that you, that you live in. And so, um, you know, as we kind of put together this entire platform that, that does 90% of the heavy lifting for our clients, pre-purchase, during purchase and post-purchase, we have a whole program for our clients post-purchase, um, in addition to just regular property management to help them, you know, uh, transition from uh, buyer to owner and to not only know what to do with, with that property over time, but also if they have issues with their property management company, we're kind of the 600 pound gorilla and, and we can kind of step in and help, help, you know, 
uh, connect the client with the property manager and resolve issues that they have. And so that's been a real benefit and blessing to me because I just always felt like feel this weight on my shoulders of it's like I got like now that I help them, you know, make this investment, I got to make sure that that it's successful. And so um, those are some of the, you know, the challenges and difficulty of, of like kind of being in this, this business. Um, uh, if it's the world that you live in, you understand everything that I just talked about. And, um, and so one of, that's one of the things that we do is, is we do, we, we help agents expand the geography over which they're able to work and expand um, into one additional niche. So if, let's say that you've got a, uh, you know, a sphere of influence of 100 people and five of them are interested in, in you know, investing in real estate. And if that's just not your world, number one, maybe it's not your specialty. And number two, I mean, if you live in, um, I don't know, Los Angeles or New York or um, it's Salt Lake City, um, it's pretty hard to find real estate investments that can make sense for just a regular person who has a little bit of a down, down payment money um, and they need to cash flow. Like it's, it's pretty hard to cash flow in, in some of these markets right now. And, and the amount of money that you have to come up with to get into a property, even at just 20 or 25% down can be extremely difficult. And so um, through our, through what we've put together, you know, for instance, Kelly refers people to us on a fairly regular basis. So she'll refer one of her clients to us and we help them go through the process and buy a property in Florida or Tennessee, Indiana, or uh, um, Oklahoma, uh, or one of the markets that, that we're in. And so she just expanded her ability to service her clients. And then we pay um, a ref, you know, the, the referral fee to her. So she, she does another real estate transaction that she otherwise wouldn't have done, number one. Number two, she helped one of her clients that she otherwise couldn't have helped. And three, and most importantly, is that that, that client uh, got to work with a group of individuals who uh, are, are absolutely expert at what they're doing, and we're able to facilitate and help them uh, uh, move forward in their uh, uh, investing, real estate investing world um, in, in a way that uh, um, is uh, life-changing. Yeah, it is. And uh, in Colorado Springs here, when I was looking for houses, the prices were just getting so high. I look at that rent ratio, that what can I get for rent on the year versus what do I have to put into it? And it would just, it was, it was getting so slim. When I looked at the done for you homes and the rent ratio that I could get in these other markets where I could buy a house, a really good producing house at, at that time for 200, 250, even now 275, I can't do that in Colorado Springs or Denver. It just just doesn't work. Now, hey Kelly, can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. So I know what we're talking about, you know, about real estate and stuff, but I I know that you also. Um, are a financial planner and you do a concept called banking on yourself. It's something that I've done um, for 30 plus years now, um, quite frankly, and have, have found this concept of banking on yourself to be an integral part of the real estate investing that I've done personally. Um, is, is that something that you, that this would be kind of a, a place where you could share some of that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, as a real estate investor or as a realtor, we sit cash heavy. We, I'm, we're always saving money, you know, to get to that eighty, hundred thousand dollars to buy, to put that twenty down and put that those closing costs. We're sitting on a lot of cash, and as a realtor in general, any commission based person, we're not quite sure when that next deal is going to close. So we're we're sitting on a lot of cash for that reason too. So I learned a number of years back how to make that cash actually work for me while I'm waiting for that next thing. Let me actually, Kathy, or Kim, do you mind if I share my screen here for a minute? And let me just kind of maybe show a picture of it. Now it's not being nice. It's not letting me pick a window. It's coming. Okay, can you guys see my screen and just see a white blank? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm gonna see if I can paint. There we go. Okay. So if you just look at investing in real estate, you know, real estate is, is a great asset. If you had a hundred thousand dollars that you wanted to invest, 
and let's say that investment grew at you know, roughly 17%, you'd be pretty happy with that over a 20 year period to watch the compounding of that asset. That asset, just $100,000 for 20 years would compound to about 2.4 million. And you'd look at that momentum, the wealth momentum and say, wow, that, that, that really served me well, that 100,000 served me well. Now, if you invested it in the market or you invested it in this foundational product I'm talking about, then it, it may not do quite as well as the real estate does. And so maybe it's earning like 9% instead, okay? And over a 20 year period of time, just take 100,000 compounded. And at 9%, that would compound out to about 600,000. You'd still be okay with that, but if you were an either or investor mindset and you were picking between making 9% in the market or 9% in, in this foundational tool or making 17% in real estate, you'd, you'd go with the real estate. You'd look at the numbers and absolutely go with the real estate. So that's kind of an either or choice. The choice I'm talking about is called the power of and. Yeah, oops, let's see if I can get it written. And, and that's really what we're talking about is let's do both, okay? So you put your money in a foundational asset. It's earning, let's say, say 9%, okay? And then when you get enough of it there that you can go buy a house, you take it out, you, you borrow it from yourself. And so it's earning 9%, you borrow it from yourself, you're paying 5% on that money. And so you're still getting a positive, what we call arbitrage of 4%. So the money's physically not there anymore. You, you put it in your foundational asset, you borrowed it out, you went and bought your houses. That, this is what I do every day. This is what Steve does. You go buy your houses. So it's still, they think it's in there. They're counting as, as if it's in there. You're paying 5% for the use of that money. So you're still making money. Now compound that out, take that 100,000, let's just say you just did that day one. So you're earning 17% on your real estate, you're earning another 4% positive arbitrage on the money that you stuck down here in your foundational asset. And so if you add those two together, then you're sitting at 21% overall between both those, the real estate and the foundational asset. And if you just compound that 100,000 out for 20 years, now all of a sudden you're sitting here at 4.2 million. It is, this is how you start to build the momentum in your portfolio. So it's just a very interesting concept. Once I learned a little bit about it and, and started doing it myself, um, it's, it's amazing how it just starts to take off. So Steve, th thanks for allowing me to dive into that just a little bit. But I have another question for you and probably something that's on a lot of people's minds. And then we're going to actually open it up for questions here. Interest rates are going crazy, up another quarter of a percent, uh, or three quarters of a percent. And the feds are saying we're just going to keep going with it. Um, as a real estate investor, that tightens my cash flow. I got to pay more for the money I'm using, and I leverage. I love leverage too. Um, but it makes it much tighter. Talk to me about why now would be a good time to buy when interest rates are just going nuts. Yeah, that's that's such a great a great question um, because we don't know where the top of this is, do we? Um, it it could continue to go up uh, significantly. Um, so I do actually have quite a few thoughts in this. So I'll, I'll I'll just share a couple of them. The first thing that I would say is, um, I've never I've never known of or heard of a real estate agent who said that the interest rate on the loan that they got for real estate is what made them wealthy or not. Um, the interest rate is important from the standpoint of, you know, your cash flow. Obviously, as interest rates go up, you know, your cash flow goes down because your, your monthly mortgage payment is, is higher. Um, but let me, let me just, I'll, I'll back up just a little bit to, in, in 1971, I was three years old. And so I, I wasn't investing in real estate yet. And I didn't know anything about what was going on um, in the world. But I have gone back and I've done a little bit of search in, in, uh, in history. And what's really interesting about our times right now, so we've got, we got interest rates that are climbing. 
I'm not even going to say that interest rates are high. They're only high in comparison to having been um, spoiled, like literally spoiled for the last several years, right? Um, interest rates historically are still, you know, um, below historic averages. Number one. Number two, inflation is high. Number three, the world is in crazy turmoil. Um, communism is on the march. There are wars going on. They're, like there's like in 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 our world, whether we're starting a business, whether we're investing in real estate, whether we're becoming a real estate agent for the first time, or whether we've been an agent for a long time, like the world is always in turmoil. Like there's no way around it. And so if we're always waiting for things to be better before we invest, you're never going to invest. I mean, over the last five years, we've had probably the best conditions for investing in real estate, you know, uh, in history, possibly. And I have a young friend who finally bought his first investment property. Uh, he's closing on it like this week, actually. And he's been looking at investing like for he's been he's been in a position where he could have invested in real estate five plus years ago. And every time he got close to doing it, you know, he'd see something on the news or a friend or family member would be like, are you crazy? And and he he held off and he held off. He didn't invest, you know, during the time before the pandemic, which was an amazing time. He didn't invest during the pandemic because, oh, my goodness, his world is collapsing. And now post pandemic with hyperinflation, with a lot of inflation and, and craziness going on in the world, like there's always a reason not to get in. And, and, and so the, the, the reality is, is um, you have to look at all the different factors, including interest rates and whether you can, can make it work. But let's look at this for a second. Let me ask you, all of you here a, a question. Uh, I want you to, to, to answer for yourself. So in, 19, um, in the 1970s, Interest rates were between 14 and 17% for a mortgage. Home prices, you know, you could buy the house I'm living in right now. Um, you probably could have bought it for $50,000. Let me ask, and, and today, today, that home is, is worth like $1.1 million. So let me ask you today, is there anyone here who would not have bought that home at 14% interest for $100,000 back in 1975? Would anybody, knowing what you know today, is there anybody here who would not buy that home then? Of course not. We all would have done it, right? Because what, what we would have done is three years later, we would have refinanced it at 8%. And then a few years later, we would have refinanced it at 5%. And then 15 years later, we would have refinanced it at 2.6%. And along the way, we would have had all of this crazy appreciation. So in hindsight, I don't think there's anyone here listening today that would be like, oh, no, I, I, I wouldn't have done it because interest rates were 14% or 17%. I think we all would have figured out how to get that done, right? If we knew today, if we, if we knew then what we know today. And, and guess what? We're we're living 1970 to 1980 right now. It's all, like you look at the headlines from Time magazines between 1971 and 1981, and everything that we're facing and experiencing today is exactly what we were facing and experiencing then, except like even more so back then. And so today, oh my goodness, an investment loan is six and a half percent. Like I got loans in the in the in, in the early 2000s, when I first started investing at, at six and a half, seven and seven and a half percent. And it's, and it worked then. And it, it actually works today. Yes, it is true. Your cash flow, instead of your cash flow being four or $500 a month, uh, the homes that our clients are buying today, you know, cash flow is anywhere from, you know, a hundred dollars to $350 per month. So it's not as good, but is, are you going to let that trip you up? from getting into the game. The biggest challenge today is not figuring out reasons why not to get into the game, but figuring out, okay, if I'm gonna get into the game, how am I gonna do this? And what does it look like? And what's my plan and what's my strategy? And, um, and so, yes, like we have to hit interest rates head on. We can't get the same cash flow. 
But of all of the revenue streams that I described you know, 15 minutes ago, cash flow is the least of them. It's the least important of all of them. It's important. Don't get me wrong. But it's the least of it. Like cash flow is not going to make you wealthy. It's going to, it's, it's nice. It's convenient. Um, it, it's, it's a great benefit, but it's not going to make you wealthy. It's the other things that, that make, that, that um, make you wealthy. And so that's kind of, um, you know, my thoughts on, on it. Now, here's the other thing, like interest rates right now on an investment property, are anywhere from 6.5 to 7.25, depending on a few different factors. Well, interest rates might go up to 10%. They might be 10% at this time next year. And, and so um, do you want to get in at, at six and a half percent or at 10 and a half percent? Um, number one. And number two, even when they are 10 and a half percent, if they ever go that, that high, um, it's still going to be the right time to buy uh, investment real estate uh, because of all of the other benefits. So if you look at, like, if you look at your cash on cash, um, like if you look at like the performance that we do for our clients um, as they're analyzing a property, you know, to, a year ago, um, return on investments were the cash on cash was, you know, five, six, seven, eight, not sometimes 9% today. It's between one and a half and three and a half percent. So it's a significant, you know, it's a significant um, uh, difference. But when do you, so that's an important number to look at, but an even more important number, the combined cash on cash, which is your cash flow, your principal pay down and your depreciation, those, those three things. All of a sudden it gets exciting again because you're always about 11 to 13%. It's like, my goodness, you're kidding me. Like those are all real, like, like appreciation. Sometimes we think it's like, ah, oh, well, you know, um, it's not quite real. Like it's, it's doing its thing. Depreciation is real. Like that's money in the bank. Principal pay down. That's money in the bank. Your cash flow, that's money in the bank. And even at today's rates, we're still double digits. And so um, uh, interest rates are important. There's no getting around it, um, but uh, they're, they're not the most important thing. Thank you. Thank, thank you for clarifying that. Um, let's open it up to questions. Brandy, uh, you have a question about being a new agent and how to get started. Let me have you go ahead and verbalize your question. We'll have Steve take it. Hi, thanks guys. Um, yeah, just curious. I'm brand new to real estate. I'm coming out of financial services. Um, and I'm curious, one, what are those steps as a new agent that you would say, you know, what do I need to be aware of and really looking for as I'm trying to build cash flow um, and ultimately heading in the direction of investing? And then um, Kelly, I also had a question about what you were presenting um, because I'm a little familiar with some of the financial products. I'm curious what kind of product you were talking about there because I feel like there is something there even that I might be able to do and help um, other investors with. So I'm just curious there. Perfect, Steve, let's start with you on, on a new agent. Yeah, I, I remember those days um, like they were yesterday. It, it's crazy that 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 was about 17 years ago for me. I, I I look in the mirror every day and I don't recognize myself anymore. I, I, if I don't see a mirror, I feel like I'm you know 20. And then I look in the mirror, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm 53. <laughs> but anyways, um, I I remember, uh, you know, starting up as a brand new agent, and I had come from the business world and I'd I'd been running a company, and so I knew that it was important to work on my business as well as in my business. And so there's two things. Number one, the most important thing that you can possibly do as an agent is prospect. It's the most painful part of being a real estate agent, but it is the number one thing that you can possibly do. Because at the end of the day, um, real estate agents are not agents unless you have a client. Um, and so really the, the reality is, is you're a marketer, you're a salesperson, and you've got to, you've got to get out and you've got a prospect. So you have to figure out um, kind of what your niche is. If you want to work with first time home buyers, then you look at like, how do I get, how do I identify first time home buyers? There's some, there's some agents, they're door knockers. They go out and knock doors. There's other agents that, um, you know, are first, you know, they, they, you can get lists of, of individuals that would maybe qualify as first time home buyers. For me, I was getting into the investment side of things. And so what I did is I'd been, I had been, I was a member of the Home Builders Association. 
And in my area, there were about 600 of those people. And I'd served in different positions in that organization. And so um, a lot of people knew who I was. And so that's who I marketed to. And that's almost exclusively who I marketed to, my friends and family. And then I got the list of the 600 members of the, home, of the local home builders association. And I created something that was called, I called it the Earl report. And so it was a report of, I would, I would, you know, find all the, all the deals that I thought were good deals on the MLS. And I would create a report and I would, I would send it out and I would provide some, a little bit of little tidbits of information, but on, on a, on a monthly basis, I send out I sent out their old report to these 600 people, and so I prospected them. I'd call them. I did a lot of lunches and that kind of a thing, and that's how I um, got going. But prospecting number one, number two is working on your business. I used to uh, two nights a week. I would stay late at the office, and everybody would be going home, and I would stay until eight o'clock and work on my business. And I remember an agent coming to me one day and, and, and he asked me the question. He's like, so what do you do when you stay late at night? What are you doing? I was like, well, I'm working, I'm working on my business. And he was just, he was so confused. He's like, what, what is that? Like, what do you do? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm figuring out like this list. I'm writing the Earl report. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm figuring out like, how do I write up contracts? I'm figuring out like, um, I'm, if I have a deal in process, I'm 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 working on on some of the nuances there. I'm like I'm working on like how do, what are my systems and my processes? Um, at, at one point, as a as a sole agent, um, I had on average 15 deals going at any moment in time, and so I had to figure out like how do I manage this? And and so I created um, I'm kind of a systems and process kind of a person, and so I. I figured out like how do I keep the flow? How do I stay in communication? Uh, I need to make sure that I'm contacting you know my my clients on a regular basis throughout the the, the process, while at the same time figuring out how to not um, uh, uh, stop doing my prospecting. And so things, so those two things: prospecting and working on your business. Randy, did that answer your question, or was there more to it? Um. The the p the thank you very much. That was actually very helpful. I took a lot of notes while you were talking. <laughs> um, in terms of the cash flow part and getting that up and going, what would you recommend again as a new agent who has no cash flow to how does how do you get that going? And I'll I'll start with that one, Steve. Um, okay. I have a lot of people that come to me that say, you know, I I really want to do real estate investing. I have nothing to work with. I have I have no nothing saved. And I think whether you're kind of working in the corporate world, which I did, where you put aside a, a portion of your income, or whether you work in the commission-based world, I always take a percentage of my paycheck and I put it into a separate account, an investment account. I, I do my taxes that way, um, and then I do the, my investments that way. So I take a percentage of my paycheck and just squirrel it away. And then, yeah, I don't. I, I pay myself first, uh, taxes and, and investments. And then that money just starts to grow um, little by little until it gets to the point that all of a sudden it's enough to really go do something with. So if you're just starting out, it's creating that discipline to just start the process of putting some away. And so if somebody's you know very expense heavy and we're not sure quite how much they're gonna be able to save, we just stick it in the bank for now, just to get started on the discipline of saving it and not touching it. Um, until we can get to the point that we can start investing it to get it to create some momentum to get enough to move it into real estate. Does does that help, Brandy? Yes, well, and, thank you very much. So when you say cash flow, do you mean like ca cash flow from your real estate agent business as well, or just on the yes. investment side? Yes. <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> Yeah, it's like so. Being a real estate agent, you, um, it's important that you have a little bit of staying power because if you're a brand new agent, you probably won't close a deal for six months. Um, there's a good chance that that may be the case. You may already have some stuff in the pipeline. I don't know, but a, a typical real estate agent getting going. Uh, I remember listening to. Uh, I used to go to this entrepreneurial forum, and I'd listen to these successful entrepreneurs talk about their stories. And I went up and talked to the speaker of, of, of one of the speakers at one of these uh, um, things that I went to. 
And I was like, so how do you get going in business? Like, like you you talked about all like having to invest in equipment and this and that and the other. Is like, so do you like go get a job to like pay your bills along the way? Or like how do you like get into business? And he was like, Yep. <laughs> and it was like, like you you have to do whatever it takes when you're starting a small business, which is what you are doing. Being a real estate agent is nothing more than a business. Um, you're just in the business of real estate of generating um, commissions. Uh, you, you have to figure out how to stay alive financially while you get your business going. Dave, I have a couple of questions. Um, what is what are you looking for on a minute as a minimum return on you know a monthly on the on the monthly return on the investment when you're looking for property? So I have two questions. That's the first. Yeah. So uh, we always look at three numbers. The first one is just cash flow, right? So if it if you're out of pocket eighty thousand dollars and your rent is two thousand dollars a month, and after you pay your mortgage and any ma management fees, let's say that you're left with, um, you know, I don't know, uh, three hundred dollars. Um, let me just get a calculator here. So if you had $300 positive cash flow on average for a year, that would be $3,600. Divide that by your $80,000 total out of pocket. That's a 4.5% return on investment. And so we like in today's market, I mean, we deliver 60% uh, of probably 65% of the homes that we deliver to our clients are, are new construction. So there's very little ongoing maintenance with, with those properties. And we typically buy you know, newer homes. Our goal is to buy, you know, is to find properties that are going to have as few expenses along the way as possible, but you can always expect some. And, and, and we build that into the pro forma. Um, uh, right now it's, uh, you know, about 8% is what we account for there of, of the revenue coming, coming in. And so if we're between 1.5 and, and higher, as far as just the cash on cash, um, uh, we'll take a, a close look and, and depending on the client, their circumstances and the type of property, um, if it's a brand new construction, we're willing to go lower on that return on investment. If it's a little bit older home, we need to have a little bit higher because there will be some, you know, some maintenance. Um, and so in today's market, just the cash on cash, um, it, you know, like I said, it's the 1.5 to, to 4.5. Is that just because of the, you know, where you look at the bigger picture of just the overall investment, how the appreciation happens there? Because yeah, it's because the way we look at investing, it's not short term, right? Um, uh, most most of our, we, we, we teach our investors that it's not about like the cash flow is the least of all of the benefits that you're going to get from that home. Yeah. And so uh, we look at that uh, principal pay down and the depreciation. When we add that on top of the cash flow, we're tip we're it's typically double digits. If it's not double digits, then we're we're looking very carefully. Hey, does this does this home make sense? Um, and so that's the second number we look at is the combined cash on cash because those are real dollars um, to you uh, that you have to consider, or you're going to make a bad decision. If you're making a decision based on just the cash flow, especially in today's market, um, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna miss out on some amazing opportunities um, uh, as far as uh, investments to purchase. And then, of course, the third number is we add in the ap appreciation as well. My limited uh, conservative self, like always, like uh, cash on cash is always, you know, Kelly knows cash. On, that's important to me. So anyway, it's interesting, you know, to expand our mindset. But the second question I had just real quick, and I know we're about out of time, but um, what's your, um, what are your opinions about short-term rentals? So we just did our first one last year and, you know, we've got a couple of long-term and personally so far I've been a fan of it, but just curious, you've been around the game for a long time. Like what's your feeling on short-term? Yeah. I think short-term rentals can be awesome. Um, and, but I think it also has a lot to do with just, you know, who you are and, 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 uh, 
your tolerance for for risk. They're definitely more risky. Um, there's there's so number one depends on the time of year. Um, you know, it's it, as far as you know, some months you're hundred percent occupancy. Other months you're potentially really low. And so you you have to be disciplined with the income coming in and and kind of average that out. Number one, number two, uh, it's it's just way more volatile. So it's a lot you know riskier riskier. Uh, Airbnb is one of their main competitors out of San Francisco uh, about five weeks ago, like literally overnight shut their doors. Like they were a significant player and they just shut their doors. Um, and you kind of wonder, it's like, man, what, what happened there? Cause you know, my short-term rentals are going great. Um, but uh, again, just things that happen in the world, all of a sudden people aren't traveling a pandemic or, I don't know, hyperinflation and um, changes in the economy and then people stop traveling. They don't need places. Whereas people need a consistent place to live. Mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of short-term rentals personally. I think that they're, they're, they can be a great thing. Um, but for, I think for the average person out there, um, I, I think they can be a little bit overwhelming and a little bit risky. Maybe not the first place to start for most. But. Yeah, I think that that's kind of phase two, personally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great question. Yeah, yeah. You want to? I know we're about out of time, Jeff. You want to wrap us up? Yeah, I mean, I think just a couple things that I would point out. I mean, because again, I mean, my wife and I. I mean, we're working with Kelly a little bit. We need our second meeting, Kelly. We haven't forgotten you. I, I promise you, it's been crazy. In and out of town. Anyway, we're working with her on some things, but definitely something uh, just as realtors, I would tell you guys, you know, just it's worth, you know, reaching out to Steve, um, the, the, his website's down there in the chat, um, something you can refer, you know, any of your clients to. And again, they don't have to be just investors. It could just be, you know, the people that you're, again, they work with so many of the mom and pop kind of investors, you know, whatever, where, you know, and again, let's say you refer them out there and over the next 10 years, they buy 10 properties. I mean, I know you guys do referral fees, Steve, on, you know, continuing out over 10 years. I mean, whatever. So I know, Kelly, you've referred a lot of your people to Steve over the years who are still with Steve and done for you. And I love the fact for me personally, like I've had rental properties here locally and I just, you know, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm the one that I'll stay away. But if I'm in the neighborhood, we, you know, I'm showing a house and it's two streets over and I was going to drive by the house. Oh my God, they have a mother yard in three weeks here in, in a month. And it just makes me crazy. So the fact that I don't have to think about these, that it's done for you <laughs> through Steve's company, that's the thing that really appeals to me about what he's doing. We're working on getting some things together because I definitely want to move forward with that myself personally. And I've, I've talked to my kids about it. I've, I know I've sent you guys several people in the last month or so, um, some different people. And going to continue to do that. So something to think about for all of you, you know, as realtors for your own, you know, portfolio of investments, something to dig into and look at, but also for your clients and past clients, friends, family, whatever, something to look at, um, you know, over time. But Kelly, is there anything you want to wrap it up with at all, with Steve I, at all? I just want to thank Steve for taking the time to Definitely. come on and I appreciate you and and Steve, um, I know you've been looking at EXP. Is that a consideration for you in the future? Yeah, we I, we're we're in process actually. Um, uh, just based on the type of organization that we are, a little bit higher volume and uh, some some different complexities, uh, we're just working out some of the bugs. And yeah, we will one hundred percent be a part of EXP. I think it's a fantastic organization, and there's some some fringe benefits that come along with being a part of EXP that. You just can't get in the rest of the real estate world in terms of, of uh, you, you know, what it can do for you in the future, retirement planning, that kind of a thing. And then just the community is is just fantastic. Uh, uh, individuals like yourself and uh, Jeff and Sean and, you know, Kathy, Kim, others who who just are just uh, an amazing resource that you can just, you can call up at any time and the community is such that everybody's just so willing. I was in a, in a real estate brokerage where everybody, they, they keep everything tight to the vest, right? It, it's like, I, I'm not going to tell you my secrets here. Everybody's like an open book. It's like, Hey, here's what I do. This is like, how can I help you? And so um, it's just a fantastic community that I'm excited to be a part of here in, in short order. Well, welcome, you welcome you to the family. Yeah, for sure. Uh, It'll be great having you on. For sure. Well, Steve, thank you very much. I know you're a busy guy and we appreciate your time coming over here. 
Um, Kelly, thank you for yeah. putting this together. I know there's plenty more that we can talk to you about. If you have not seen Kelly's first uh, mastermind she did here again about a month ago or so, if you're part of Freedom Team, you can go into the workplace group, all the recordings of everything we've done for, we're coming up on a year now of doing these every Tuesday. Um, they're all in there and uh, including Kelly's, but we could always email that to you as well. We will have this one posted up in the workplace group within the next hour. Um, so you can always go back and, and rewatch things and you know, go back to that certain clip that you want to, you know, get caught up on, but feel free to email any of us or message any of us, uh, post on their comments, questions, whatever, we will definitely get them answered for you, but we'll be back um, next Tuesday. Next Tuesday, guys, just a reminder, the first Tuesday of the month, we always just have kind of an open forum, no specific topic. So I tell you guys, you know, come with questions, come with a topic that you want to discuss. Okay. And, uh, and we'll jump on that just open forum. Let's all, we'll all participate in that one. So, um, but, uh, but thank you guys for being on, uh, Kelly, thank you again, Kathy. Thank you so much for all you do. Uh, Kim, we appreciate it. All the work you're doing as well. So guys have a great week and, um, we'll see you back here next week. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Steve. Thanks Kelly. Thanks Bye -bye. guys. Bye-bye. Bye y'all.